We're doing a study on the life of Moses. We're calling this Moses the man of God. If you do not have the syllabus, please contact our office and we'll see that you obtain a copy. It will help you in your own spiritual study. Moses the man of God. This particular lesson I'm going to call Who Killed Moses? Who Killed Moses? It's a little unique title, but I think you'll understand what I'm saying as we get into this story. Let me read you the scripture text. It's a little lengthy, but it'll set the background of what I want to share with you in this lesson. Numbers, the 20th chapter, verses 7 and 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the people, the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and smote the rock twice with his rod. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. My, what an amazing story. Amazing story. And one of the things that stands out to me is this is toward the end of the 40 years of their wandering in the wilderness. It would be in the last year, last year and a half of that wandering experience where this story takes place. And in it we discover Moses deliberately disobeying God. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. See, God's spoke to him and said, I want you to speak to the rock. The Bible said he smote it. God said, speak to the rock. But instead of speaking to the rock, he takes the rod of God that's in his hand and he begins smiting the rock. The Bible said he smote it twice, twice. Now, th this is why the psalmist many years later, writes about this incident and he tells us what's happening inside Moses. This is the problem. You can hear it in his words when he said, must we fetch water for you rebels? He's calling the children of Israel rebels. Beware, beware of what's happening. Now, in Psalm 106, verses 32 and 33, it says, they angered him also at the waters of strife so that it went ill with Moses on account of them, because they rebelled against his spirit, so that he spoke rashly with his lips. There's the problem. The problem is Moses gets angry, Moses explodes, Moses speaks rashly with his lips because he allowed them to provoke his spirit. Beware of that. Beware of that. And anyone that is in a leadership position, sooner or later is going to be challenged. Sooner or later. And you've got to be careful that you do not allow them to provoke your spirit so that you do foolish things like Moses did. Now, we know the story. We've heard the story. Let me see if I can answer the question, why did Moses rebel against God? Why was it? We know what he did. Let's see if we can discover why he did it. Here's the first thing. The first thing is Moses was emotionally wounded. Emotionally wounded. Here's what I mean by this. Miriam, Moses' sister, has just died at Kadesh. She's just died. Now, they've been wandering for almost 40 years in the wilderness, but according to the biblical record, this is the first time that he's personally experienced a loss. Let me read it to you, Numbers, the 20th chapter and verse 1. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, 
came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed at in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now, this is a personal loss in Moses' life. Moses has been with the Israelites in the wilderness for almost 40 years, and he has seen a lot of funerals. But of all the funerals that he's experienced, this is his first personal loss. His first personal loss. Because Miriam was his sister. It was his sister. And, and this is so important in his life that it's recorded in the scripture. Recorded for us to read, to study. What's happening to Moses? Moses is grieving over his sister. Grieving over his sister. She's had to die with this this unbelieving generation. Moses regrets that very deeply, that his sister never saw the promised land. Grief is a powerful force, a powerful force. And you need to take time to recover from that. Obviously, Moses has not recovered. And so that's one of the reasons why he did what he did. Here's a second reason. Second reason I notice is Moses is spiritually discouraged. Spiritually discouraged. Here's what I mean by this. They are at Kadesh. Forty years before they had been at this same mountain. Forty years before they had camped at Kadesh. That's where they rebelled against God and refused to go into the promised land. Let me read for you. You'll find this in Numbers, the 14th chapter, verses 32 through 34. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land. 40 days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. That was 40 years ago. 40 years ago, they had been at this same spot, the place of Kadesh. Now here's the point. The point is, when a church refuses to follow God, and they say, no, we don't want to do that, guess who gets sentenced to go with them in their wilderness wanderings? That's right, the pastor, the shepherd of the flock. And that's what is happening in this story. It wasn't because of Moses, no. It wasn't Moses that failed to believe God. Moses' faith was in God. Moses' faith was strong. Moses is encouraging them, come on, we can do it. We, this is the promised land, the land that God has promised to us. They rebelled against God. They refused to go. And as God said, it's your children that are going to suffer. They're going to bear the brunt of your infidelity. Wow, what powerful word. And what a warning to you and I. Don't fail to follow God. Follow him by faith. Now, and so we see he's emotionally wounded. He's spiritually discouraged. Here's the third thing. The third thing I see is Moses is physically weary. Physically weary. Where does that come from? It goes back to the story that we talked about in the previous lesson in Numbers, the 16th chapter. He's just gone through this exhausting rebellion of Korah. Oh, rebellion will take a lot out of you. It always does. It's an exhausting experience. See, the truth of it is, it's not just the rebels that lose in such a case. Everybody loses in a rebellion. Everybody, including Moses. Not just the people, not just those that were the rebels, Everybody loses. In this story, for instance, you find the rebels losing, the leaders, Israel. You find the people of Israel and the kingdom of God. Everybody loses in a rebellion. God help us never to forget that because there are so many times we're tempted to become rebellious. 
When we do, it's a lose-lose situation. So this is why I believe that Moses did what he did. Now let me ask you another question. And that question is the most important of all. What could have been done that would have saved Moses? What could have happened? What could have taken place? Or maybe I should say what should have taken place that would have kept Moses from rebelling against God and, and smiting the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Let me give you three points again. Here's the first one. Where were the encouragers? The encouragers. Where are the people that are going to stand up for Moses, encourage him through this difficult time? Let, let me give you the scripture reference behind this. In Numbers the 20th chapter and verse 3 it says, And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Here they are complaining again. Complaining. And we see this over and over through the story of Israel. Always complaining. It's the mindset of a slave. Thinks like a slave. And so they're complaining. But the question is, were all the people complaining? I seriously doubt that. I seriously doubt it because when you study the story, you will find there is between two to three million people that are camped in the wilderness. That, that, that's a large group of people. The truth is you can't even see that many people the natural eye at one time unless you would happen to be high on an airplane or such. There's no way from the ground level that you could see two to three million. There's no way you can hear two to three million at the same time. But the truth is, Moses can't hear everybody, but the ones he does hear are complaining. The complainers always make sure their voice is heard. And that's why it is so important for us to become encouragers. I believe it's one of the most important things that a leader can do is encourage his people, his followers. I believe it's one of the most important things that followers can do is encourage their leaders. Encourage their leaders. Where were the people to stand up for Moses? Where were the people to encourage him and say, Moses, we're almost out of this 40 years. We're, we're down now into the last year, the last year and a half. We'll soon be out of this wilderness. We're going to make it. We're almost home. If there would have just been one encouraging voice, it would have made the difference. Here's the second thing. The second thing is, where were the elders? The elders. These are the people that are a part of Moses' leadership team. Where are the people that, that Moses is relying upon them to help him to lead this vast congregation of people? Two to three million people is more than any one man can lead. They're allowing Moses to suffer alone. My question is, why did you do that? Why did you allow Moses to suffer alone? One of the signs of spiritual maturity is standing with your leader. Standing up for what you know is right, even when people are complaining. Now, it has well been said, the strength which comes from just one true friend is amazing. Just one true friend that will stand by your side, put their arm around your shoulders and say, you're doing a good job, Moses. You're doing a good job. This, this can be a very challenging task. But... It's not your fault that we're here in the wilderness. No. See, just one friend, just one friend speaking encouragement can make the difference between victory and defeat. Just one. And if there had been anyone that would have stood up with Moses and stood beside him and said, what are you complaining about? What, what are you grumbling about again? What, what is your problem? It's not Moses' fault that we're here in the wilderness. We're the ones that failed to believe God. It's our fault. And that brings me to my third point. 
The third one is, what could have been done to save him? Why blame Moses? Why do you want to put the blame on him? I've discovered it's always a sign of immaturity to blame somebody else for our troubles. In other words, it's your fault that I'm not happy. I did that because of what you did. That's always a sign of immaturity. Why don't we grow up? Why don't we act like adults? Why, why don't we keep pointing our finger at somebody else? I've found that's usually the case. The reason we point our finger at others is to keep people from looking at us. It was not Moses' fault. They were in the wilderness, in this desert. That was not Moses' fault. It never was Moses' idea for them to live in the desert. No, no, he's going to lead them into the promised land. This was not the promised land. This is the wilderness wanderings. That was not Moses' idea. He was attempting to lead them to the promised land, and yet they refused again and again to obey, to worship. They complained. They rebelled. Oh, no wonder Moses is exhausted by all of this problem. Now, there's an interesting scripture found in the New Testament where it's talking about the heroes of faith. And of course, one of those heroes is Moses. Moses. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 24 through 26, it says, By faith, Moses, when he came of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Now, the reason I point out this scripture is because there's a very interesting phrase there where it said, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. That's what he chose. That was his decision. But when you study the story, you discover the record shows he suffered more from the people of God than he ever did with the people of God. I believe that is usually the case. Almost every case, you will find that the people of God can break your heart they did Moses. They challenged him continually. So he suffers more from them than he does with them. Someone has well said, Egypt and all its glory couldn't keep Moses out of the promised land. And that is the truth. He chose to suffer with the people of God. He was looking toward the reward. The reward, of course, is the promised land. Egypt could not keep him out of the promised land, but Israel not only could, Israel did. What a tragedy. This great man of God, this man of God that knew God like very few men have ever known God, and yet they're provoking his spirit to rebel against God. They provoked him. He begins to speak rashly with his lips. Oh my, don't you know the devil laughed that day and heaven wept. Because of their rebellion, the rebellion of the Israelites, they provoked Moses' spirit to disobey God. And the result was they stopped him. They kept him from fulfilling his life's dream. His dream, the dream that he had had since he was 40 years of age, was leading his people out of slavery, leading them out of Egypt to the promised land. That was his goal, his dream. But they stopped him. They stopped him because he allowed them to provoke his spirit. Now, God, give us a warning. May God help us because I see this happen too many times to spiritual leaders. Many preachers, many pastors die before their time 
never reaching their God-given potential. What happens? It's not the world. No, many times it's the people in the church. It's the believers. It's the Christians that refuse to obey, that refuse to follow. And because of this, because of their rebellion against God, they kept Moses from fulfilling the dream of his life the dream of leading the children of Israel to the promised land. Now, I, I realize this is a very serious message, a very serious message, and it's one that I have witnessed with my own eyes and one that I've experienced in my own life. So many times I've been tempted to become rebellious because if we put our focus upon the rebels, we become like the people we don't like. The people that are rebelling against us, we become a rebel just like them. And that is Satan's strategy. His strategy is to get our eyes off of God, to get our eyes off of the goal, the promised land, and to get them on whatever the conflict may be. In this situation, they were in a desert. They needed some water to drink. And because they don't have water, they're complaining again. It's that mindset of slavery Slaves always complain about their problems instead of rising up and becoming strong and overcoming the problem. Now may God help us as spiritual leaders not to fall into this trap because I think that it's one of the most dangerous traps that any spiritual leader will face. The trap of becoming rebellious, of rebelling against God. Moses knew clearly what God had said he allowed his anger to take control of him. And that, that's the dangerous thing about anger. And, and Paul warns us about it where he says, be angry, but don't sin. Don't cross the boundary. See, if we're not careful in anger, we step over the boundary. The Bible tells us, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And when we step over that boundary and we start playing like we are God, must we fetch water for you rebels out of this rock? No, no, no. It's not about me. It's not about them. It's about God and his kingdom. And as long as we keep our focus on God and the promised land, the kingdom of God, we will be okay. But the moment we, like Moses, and it can be emotional discouragement, it can be our spiritual discouragement. It can be that we are physically exhausted. Those are all dangerous places to be. I, I discovered this in my own life as a leader. I remember the time that I, I allowed myself to be pushed too far, too far. And God helped me not to speak rashly with my lips, even though I was severely tempted to do so. I... I kept my peace, but the despondency that came upon me and, and I, I, I just wanted to die. I just, God, if I, am I going to have to live with this the rest of my life? And, and I was so despondent because of that. I had always tried to live my life to the maximum, pushing myself right to the breaking point. But I discovered that's a very dangerous place to be because... Somebody can come along and push you over the edge. I used to love to live by little phrases like, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. But I've discovered you've got to keep a little space between you and the edge. If you don't, it doesn't take a very hard push to push you over. And that's what happens to Moses. What a tragedy in his life. Someone has said it like this. We are never too wise or too old to fail God. That is true, my friend. That is so true that if we're not careful, just because we've got a good track record, just because God has used our life in a great way, just because we have seen all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles, that does not give us the right to explode, to lose our temper, to speak rashly with our lips. Anytime that we do that, we're playing into the devil's hand and the devil will be very quick to take advantage of it. In Moses' case, God says, 
you're not going to take the children of Israel into the promised land. That, that was the last words that Moses wanted to hear. Now, thank God, thank God that he submitted himself back unto the authority of God and he was able to lead them up to the promised land. But, and he was able to see it with his own eyes, but he never was able to put his foot down there until you get to the New Testament. In the New Testament, we find Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration says, go get Moses. Moses can come now to the promised land. But in the Old Testament, it was not possible. And it all went back to him losing his temper, speaking rashly with his lips. May God help us not to do that. What a tragedy that this great man of God allowed the people to, to push him over the brink so that he failed in the last year of his spiritual journey, right before he's getting ready to enter into the promised land. And I feel I'm speaking to some of you right now that I'm challenging you. You're closer home than you realize. You're closer to the promised land. You're closer to the victory. The thing that you've dreamed about, you're almost there. Don't lose it. Don't waste it because someone is rebelling, complaining again. Don't allow that to get under your skin and you become like them. Don't become a rebel. Keep your cool. Stay calm. Keep your peace. Don't allow them to provoke your spirit. And if you do it, I promise you, you will see the promised land. And so may God help us on our spiritual journey as we follow Christ, not to make Moses' mistake and to speak rashly with our lips, but to give us the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, and peace.